Pentecost. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. The epistle for the third Sunday after Pentecost is from the blessed apostle Peter. Dearly beloved, be you humbled under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in the time of visitation, casting all your care upon him, for he hath care of you. Be sober and watch, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion goeth about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist ye strong in faith, knowing that the same affliction befalls your brethren who are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a little, will himself perfect you and confirm you and establish you. To him be glory and empire forever and ever. Amen. And the continuation of the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. At that time the publicans and sinners drew near unto Jesus to hear him, and the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spoke to them this parable, saying, What man is there of you that hath a hundred sheep? And if he shall lose one of them, doth he not leave the ninety-nine in the desert, and go after that which was lost, until he find it? And when he hath found it, lay it upon his shoulders, rejoicing and coming home, call together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found my sheep that was lost. I say to you, that even so there shall be joy in heaven upon one sinner that doth penance, more than upon ninety-nine just who need not penance. Or what woman, having ten drachmas, if she lose one drachma, doth not light a candle, and sweep the house, and seek diligently until she find it? And when she hath found it, call together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, because I have found the drachma which I had lost. So I say to you, there shall be joy before the angels of God upon one sinner doing penance. And thus far the words of the Holy Gospel. It is good as Catholics that we learn how to read the scriptures as a Catholic. And we learn how to read the scriptures as a Catholic by reading the commentaries of the early church fathers and the doctors, East and West. Now in the Middle Ages, or in the High Middle Ages, we have the example of St. Thomas Aquinas who compiled the commentaries of the church fathers and doctors, East and West, up to his time. And this is a work, a four-volume set, called the Catena Aurea, the Golden Chain. And so it is a chain of commentaries all woven together, linked together. And he, he takes each, each of the four Gospels, just a few verses at a time, sometimes a few words at a time, and weaves together the commentaries of the Fathers. And by reading through this, we learn how to read the Scriptures as a Catholic. And I found it very interesting in reading the commentaries for this Sunday's Gospel that the early fathers take a look at mathematics. Well, you have to consider that God created all things, including mathematics. God created the sciences. He created math. Well, let's take a look at this. Now, in mathematics, there are certain numbers that are known as perfect numbers. And a perfect number is one that is equal to the sum of its proper divisors. Now, the smallest perfect number is 6, which is the sum of 1, 2, and 3. 1 plus 2 is 3, plus 3 is 6. So that's a perfect number. Other perfect numbers are 28, 100, 496, and the number 8,128. Now, the discovery of such numbers is lost in prehistory. And Euclid, the famous Greek mathematician from whom we received the science of geometry, wrote a proof for the perfect number around the year 300 BC. 
It is known, however, that the Pythagoreans, around the year 526 BC, studied perfect numbers for their mystical properties. The mystical tradition was continued by the Neo-Pythagorean philosopher Nicomachus of Gerasa around the year 100 AD. He classified numbers as deficient, perfect, and superabundant according to whether the sum of their divisors was less than, equal to, or greater than the number, and respectively. Then Nicomachus gave moral qualities to his definitions, and such ideas found credence among early Christian theologians. Now, often the 28-day cycle of the moon around the earth was given as an example of a heavenly and hence perfect event that naturally was a perfect number, 28 being a perfect number. Well, the most famous example of such thinking is given by St. Augustine, who wrote in the City of God, six is a number perfect in itself, and not because God created all things in six days, Rather, the converse is true. God created all things in six days because the number is perfect. Well, it is not important that you understand the proof for a perfect number today. It is enough that you know that mathematics in antiquity identified such a thing, proved it, defined it, and passed it down to us today. In the Gospel today, the Lord speaks about the man who, having 100 sheep and having lost one, would leave the 99 behind to go and look for that lost sheep. Now, St. Gregory the Great then writes this in his commentary. For since 100 is a perfect number, the Lord himself had 100 sheep, seeing that he possessed the nature of the holy angels and men. Now St. Cyril then continues, we may hence understand the extent of our Savior's kingdom, for he says there are a hundred sheep, bringing to a perfect sum the number of rational creatures subject to him. For the number hundred is perfect, being composed of ten decades. But out of these one has wandered, namely the race of man which inhabits the earth. Keep in mind then that he's saying that there are 99, perhaps 99 species of, or not species, but 99, uh, let's see, what do we have here? 99 angels, however it is that they are broken up into that, but we know that we have nine choirs of angels. And then one species of Homo sapiens, well, St. Gregory then continues. One sheep then perished when man, by sinning, left the pastures of life. But in the wilderness, the ninety and nine remained because the number of the rational creatures, that is to say, of angels and men who were formed to see God, was lessened when man perished. And hence it follows, does he not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness? because in truth he left the companies of the angels in heaven. But man then forsook heaven when he sinned, and that the whole body of sheep might be perfectly made up again in heaven, the lost man was sought for on earth, as it follows, and go after that, etc. Now St. Cyril continues, But was he then angry with the rest, and moved by kindness only to one? By no means. He wasn't angry with the 99. He didn't leave the 99 because he was angry with them. By no means, but he was moved with kindness to one. For they are in safety, the 99, the right hand of the most mighty being their defense. It behooved him rather to pity the perishing, that the remaining number might not seem imperfect. For the one being brought back, the hundred regains its own proper form. And then St. Gregory again. And we must observe that he says not, Rejoice with the sheep that is found. But he says, Rejoice with me, because truly our life is his joy. When we are found, it is the joy of the Lord. It is his joy. 
So you see, 99 is an imperfect number. And God did not create anything to end in imperfection. He created everything to end in a state of perfection. Therefore, the man has to be restored to the flock so that it can be a perfect number of 100. And that is the example, the parable that our Lord gives. You see, our Lord knew mathematics, even if his listeners did not. Well, we can see here from the commentary of the fathers that the fall of man left the number of God's rational creatures at 99, which is imperfect. Now, we can also look at imperfection in another way, and perfection, and I, 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 we can relate this to the resurrection. You see, God did not create us to, to end in imperfection. Now, man, as a species, is a composite of body and rational spiritual soul. Now, if the, if the body dies, then the soul is left living, but in a state of imperfection. And so, now this doesn't have to do with mathematics so much, but rather that the soul is in a state of imperfection being separated from the body. And that is irrational to think that God would leave humanity in a state of imperfection. So therefore, the body must be resurrected in order to perfect man by bringing him back together in the end. And this is, this is a scientific explanation behind something that is given to us by divine revelation, the resurrection of the body. All right, so we have the perfection of all things, the restoration of the one to the flock, making the perfect number of 100. Consider then that when we fall and we are deprived of the state of grace, we do not deprive God of his perfection. God is always in a state of perfection. But we do deprive the body of Christ. And it is an act of injustice when we sin. First of all, because God is offended. But secondly, because we deprive the body of Christ of its perfection. Christ came to rescue the one sheep. And he wishes to rescue each and every one of us. When one person repents, the angels in heaven rejoice because the body of Christ is made more perfect. God rejoices when we, are, when we repent. We just had the feast of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Our Lord Jesus Christ in his humanity pours himself out because he has loved us so much. And what does he receive in return? Blasphemies coldness, indifference, rejection. Let us console our Lord in his sacred heart by getting right with God, helping to make the body of Christ just that much more perfect. Amen. Amen.